If you're going to measure twice and cut once, it won't do a bit of good unless you measure accurately. Start with a tape measure. Most carpenters prefer a tape with a one inch wide blade. It's stiffer and bends less. A big help if you're laying out a 25 foot wall or measuring a large opening. Cabinet makers and furniture makers like a smaller three quarter inch wide 16 foot tape. Unlike most carpenters tapes, the first foot is marked in 30 seconds of an inch, which comes in handy when precision is important. And wider tapes gets unwieldy in smaller spaces. No matter what you use, all tapes have something in common. They're marked in both inches and feet. A 20 inch piece of plywood will measure 20 inches along the lower edge of the tape and one foot eight inches along the top edge. The tape is also marked every 16 inches to simplify laying out a wall with 16 inch centers. Most tapes are also marked with a black diamond every 19.2 inches for walls with studs on a wider center. If you look at the hook at the end of the tape, you see it slides back and forth a little bit. If you're taking a measurement, say of the inside of a drawer, the hook pushes tight against the tape and the measurement is made against the outside face of the hook. Measuring the overall width of the drawer, you measure from the outside face and the hook slides away from the tape to compensate. It's safe to assume that with enough use, especially if you let the tape spring back into the body breakneck speed, the hook may get a little bent or the holes that it slides in may get elongated. For measurement is critical, measure from the one inch mark, which stays where it should no matter how fast you shoot the tape back into the body. Make your measurement and subtract an inch to get the true size of the piece. Everybody forgets to subtract the inch from time to time, so here's an insurance policy. Measure from the 10 instead of the one. An error of an inch may slip by, but you're bound to notice before you make something 10 inches longer or shorter than it's supposed to be. If a measurement is critical, draw your layout line with a knife, which gives you a narrower, more accurate line. If you're making a measurement between two walls, curling the tape up against one of the walls gives you a pretty inaccurate reading. Start by putting the end of the tape against one wall and then put the back of the tape against the other. Note the measurement and look at the side of the tape for a note telling you how long the tape body is. Add that length to your measurement for the true measurement. Don't forget to look at the back of your tape from time to time. There's often a lot of useful information printed there decimal equivalents, nail and screw sizes, and the actual size of a 2x4. Whether you're building a shed or a jewelry box, it has to be square, meaning that all of the four sides have to meet at 90 degrees. A framing square helps a lot in carpentry, and a combination square helps in cabinet making, but it's pretty clear that a garage is longer than the longest arm of a square. In large-scale layout work, Builders lay out the site with strings and batter boards and rely on the geometry of what's called a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. If the base of a triangle measures 3, and the adjoining arm measures 4, and the diagonal measures 5, then the base and arm meet at a 90 degree angle. As long as the 3, 4, and 5 are measured in the same units, the units can be anything, feet, meters, yards, or miles, and the two sides will meet at 90 degrees. Batter boards let you slide the strings back and forth until the distance between the three and four foot marks equals five feet and the corner is square. In furniture making, you can rely on a combination square for most measurements. The more expensive the square, the truer the reading. During assembly and installation, however, measure the diagonals to get the best indication of square. If the diagonals are equal, the project is square. If they differ, Slant the clamp slightly in the direction of the long diagonal. Tighten and measure again. Worried about whether something is level? Piece of cake. An object is level when the bubble is centered between the lines on a level. If it's out of level, lift it in until the bubble centers. The distance between the end of the level and the object is how far the piece is out of level at that point. Plumb? Just as easy. Turn the level. When the bubble centers in the end vial, whatever you're checking is plumb. If you need to find a point level with another point on the opposite end of the room, use a line level. Hook the level on some mason's line, 
which unlike string, won't stretch. Put the line at the first point and stretch it across the room. Lift the other end until you get a level reading and mark the point on the wall. Or if you need to lay out something like the location of some cabinets, snap a chalk line. When two things have to be screwed together, most carpenters reach for a drywall screw. Made of hardened metal with sharp points and aggressive threads, they drill their way through plywood and two bys and hold things firmly together. Other screws take a bit more preparation. The brass or steel screws you use to hang a door are too soft to push their way through something even as soft as a piece of pine. For jobs like this, you need to pre-drill a hole for the screw. The screw should be the diameter of the screw shank, the part of the screw that would be left if you removed the threads. A lot of times you can find the size of a pilot hole listed on the back of your tape measure's blade. The traditional approach, however, is to hold the screw up to the light so that you can see the threads and the shank clearly. Hold the bottom end of a drill bit against the screw. If it blocks out the shank without blocking out any of the threads, like this drill does, it's the right size. If it blocks out part of the threads or doesn't block out the shank, try the next size up or down. Incidentally, next time you plan to screw two pieces of oak together, don't plan on using drywall screws unless you drill pilot holes first. Drywall screws can do a lot, but they can't bully their way through hardwoods. When you're making straight cuts in wood, you're going to be using one of three saws, the circular saw, the miter saw, or the table saw. What you use depends on the strengths and weaknesses of each, the job at hand, and which saw you have. Let's start with cross-cutting. You can avoid a lot of confusion if you draw a line laying out the cut and mark the waist side of the board with an X. Circular saws have two marks on the plate that show you where the saw will cut. One mark shows the left side of the cut, the other shows the right side. The space between is called the kerf. Use the marks to position the saw so that the kerf, which becomes sawdust, is on the waist side of the board. With practice, you can use the notch to cut along the line and get a clean, straight cut. However, there's no point trusting your skill if the cut has to be precise. Guide the cut along a square made for the job. Position the saw. Then put the square's fence against the edge of the board and slide the square against the base plate of the saw. Back the saw away from the wood before you start the cut. And then just guide the base plate along the square. A miter saw gives you perhaps the cleanest and truest of all cross cuts. However, before you rely on it completely, make sure the cut it makes is truly square. Slowly cut through a board, you'll get a much cleaner cut. And when the blade stops, Flip one of the pieces over. If there's a gap between the pieces when you hold them against the fence, the cut isn't square. A simple adjustment described in the owner's manual will bring the saw into alignment. Despite its accuracy, the miter saw has one major drawback, width of cut. A 10-inch saw can cut boards up to 6 inches wide. A 12-inch saw can cut boards up to 8 inches wide. For cross-cutting wider boards, you'll want a table saw. When you cross cut on the table saw, you guide the cut with a miter gauge. You can buy an aftermarket gauge that is accurate to the thousands of an inch and to within one tenth of a degree. But you can also use the gauge that comes with the saw with pretty much the same results. You'll need to add two things to your miter gauge for best results. First, screw a wooden fence to the head of the gauge. This gives you a long edge that is more accurate when setting angles and provides more support when cross cutting. Secondly, Clamp a stop block to the fence so that once the block is in position, it keeps the board from moving sideways during the cut. Even minor movement will result in a cut that's not square. The block not only stops movement, but also assures that every cut you make against it will be exactly the same length. For best results, cut one end of each board, set the stop, 
and cut to the lathe at the other end. Once you're set up, set the miter gauge to zero, the setting for a square cut. Make a cut, turn off the saw, and test for the square the same way you did on the miter saw. Flip one of the boards over, put them both against the fence, and look for a gap where they meet. Make any necessary adjustments, and reset the pointer so it points directly at zero. If the stops built into the miter gauge keep you from getting to the right setting, loosen them as described in your owner's manual. Equally important is the stop that automatically positions the miter gauge at 90 degrees. On this saw, it's a screw that strikes a pin. Once you've got the miter gauge cutting a true 90 degree angle, adjust the screw so that it's against the pin. Next time you change the angle of the cut, you'll be able to set it back to 90 degrees just by turning the head of the miter gauge until it stops. When it comes to miters, both the miter saw and table saw are far more accurate than anything you could produce by trying to guide a circular saw along a pencil line. On a miter saw, cutting an angle is a matter of setting the table to the desired angle, tightening the handle and making the cut. There will be several angles, including 45 degrees, at which the saw clicks into place, simplifying adjustments. As long as you set the saw to make an accurate 90 degree cut, the angle settings and stop should be accurate too. You may have to do a bit more fussing around on a table saw. Set the miter gauge to 45 degrees with a drafting triangle. It's the cheapest accurate tool for the job. Make sure the triangle is against the body of the blade and isn't touching any of the teeth. Test the setup by cutting through a board at the 45 degree setting and flipping one of the boards over to form a corner. Hold both pieces against the drafting square. A gap in the joint means your setting is still a little bit off. Once you've got a true 45 degree angle, set the stop on the gauge as before so that you can return to the exact setting time and time again. If the indicator points to zero on a square cut and 45 on a 45 degree cut, you can trust it to be reliable at any other measurement too. However, because it's possible to be a fraction of a degree off the setting without knowing it, you always should cut a few test pieces to make sure you've got the exact angle you want. Ripping is the term used for cutting a board along the grain instead of across it. On plywood, the term is more generalized. Any cut made along the fence is generally referred to as a rip. On the table saw, set the fence so the indicator gives you the desired dimension, six inches in this case. Then double check, measuring from the fence to a tooth on the front of the blade, and then to the same tooth at the back of the saw. If the measurements aren't the width you want, adjust the fence to get the right width and then reset the pointer so it indicates the proper dimension. If the two measurements from the blade to the fence are different, double check by measuring from the front and back of the fence to the front and back of the miter gauge slot. If the measurements are still different, the fence isn't parallel to the blade. Check your owner's manual for guidance. When you're making a rip cut, check to make sure the edge is straight before cutting and joint it or straighten it with a circular saw if it isn't. The circular saw jig shown a bit later will make it easy to get a straight edge. When ripping, apply pressure with your left hand to keep the edge of the board against the fence all the way through the cut. Keep pushing until the wood clears the blade entirely. Stand to the side of the blade so that anything that flies back won't hit you. Never put your hands directly in line with the blade and use a push stick to keep them from getting close to the blade. See the section on table saw safety for more information. If you're cutting a sheet of plywood, have a helper or two support but not guide the plywood as you cut. Ironically, as the pieces get larger, they're easier to cut with a circular saw and can be quite reliable, especially if you use the jig shown here. The jig starts with a piece of half-inch plywood at least three inches wider than the base of the saw. 
Screw a 3 inch wide fence to one edge. Drywall screws work fine here. Then, guide the saw along the fence, cutting through the first piece of plywood. To rip a piece of plywood, lay out the cut and put an X on the waist side of the line. Put the jig along the line so it's over what will be the finished piece. Clamp the jig in place and guide the saw along the fence to make the cut. You can use both the table saw and circular saw for some simple, reliable joinery. Let's start with the circular saw half lap joint. Start by laying out the joint. It should be as wide as the stock and half as deep as the stock is thick. Set your saw to the right depth using the layout line. Start the joint by guiding the cut along a square to cut the shoulder. Make a series of repetitive cuts, each about 1 8 inch apart until you get out to the end of the board. Snap out the waist pieces and repeat on the other piece. Clean up the bottom of the joint with a chisel. You can use the same techniques to cut a full lap or a saddle joint. Joints this size usually are carpentry joints and are bolted together rather than glued. You can cut the joints the same way on a table saw but you'll get a cleaner joint if you use a set of stacked blades called a dado head. You can use either a stacked or adjustable dado. A stacked head gives you a cleaner cut. The adjustable dado is cheaper, but cuts a groove with a round bottom. The most accurate way to cut these joints is with a minimum of measuring. Start a cut that's purposely on the waist side of the line marking the shoulder. Stop when the dado head has cut one eighth of an inch or so into the edge of the board. Then slide the board along the miter gauge fence until the cut just kisses the layout line. Hold the board in place against the miter gauge and turn off the saw. When the blade stops spinning, ease the rip fence against the end of the board and lock it in place. Now you're ready to cut the joint. Slide the board and miter gauge back and cut through the wood. Slide the stock along the miter gauge fence and make another cut. Repeat until you've cleared away all the waste. When you've finished with one board, cut away the waste on the other board. If the bottom of the joint is uneven, you can even it up by sliding the board back and forth across the blade. Ease the board up to the blade, slide it back and forth, move it forward about 1 16th of an inch, and slide it back and forth again. Repeat until you've advanced the board all the way across the blade. Incidentally, the only type of cut in which you should use the miter gauge in combination with the fence is one that doesn't cut all the way through the board. If you use it on a through cut, the cutoff will be between the fence and the blade where it will get pinched between the two and thrown back with incredible force. The force will be great enough to drive a board through the surface of a cement block wall. You won't have to do too much work around the house to discover that there's almost no such thing as a square corner. There's not much you can do to change it, but there are a few tricks that help you get around the problem. Let's start with an outside corner. Your square tells you it's pretty badly out of alignment, and a couple of sample joints confirm that a normal 45 degree miter is only going to result in gaps. You could measure the angle with a sliding bevel, check it against a protractor, divide the angle by two, 
and set your miter saw to match. Or you could do it the easy way. Put a straight piece of scrap against the wall and trace along it. Repeat along the other wall. Now put the handle of a sliding bevel against the wall and angle the blade from the corner of the wall to where the lines meet. Lock the blade in place. Set your saw to this angle and miter a molding. Reset the saw to the same angle on the other side of zero and cut the second molding. Nail both in place. For inside corners, you can rely on a trick called the cope joint. Start by butting one of the moldings into the corner. Cut the second piece to nest against the first. Mitered is shown to reveal the profile of the molding. The profile is easy to see on this piece of pre-prime molding. If you're working on an unprime molding, trace along the edges with a pencil to highlight the shape. Most people make the next part harder than it is. Help yourself out by putting a fine tooth blade in a coping saw. A fine tooth blade has 18 to 24 teeth per inch and gives you both a smoother surface and easier turning ability than a coarse or medium blade. Let the blade do the work. Don't try to push it through the wood. Instead of cutting to create a 90 degree face, angle the saw back. This creates a point that fits tightly against the other piece, eliminating any irregularities in the surface that might hold the two pieces apart. Cut out the profile. Cutting from the edge of the board or from another part of the profile is needed. Once you've cut the joint, test fit it against a piece of scrap. You can fine tune the fit with the rat tail and a flat mill bastard file. If you're going to paint, you can also caulk to fill gaps once the pieces are installed. Want to hang a picture? It's always going to work best if you can drive the hanger into a stud. Find the stud with a stud finder, pre-drill a small hole if the wall is plaster, and nail the hanger in place. Unfortunately, studs seldom are located directly behind the spot you've chosen for a picture. On drywall, Plan B calls for drywall anchors. An anchor is a two-part hanger. Drive the nylon part into the wall with a hammer, and then turn it like a screw until it's flush. Drive the metal screw into the nylon and hang the picture from that. Read the package before you buy. Different hangers are designed to hold different weights. On a plaster wall, you can use a picture hook held in place with sharp hardened nails that come with the hanger. Just position the hook and drive the nails into the plaster. For heavier pictures, Use a molly bolt. A molly bolt fits through a hole in the wall and expands as you tighten the bolt, anchoring itself firmly against the wall. <laughs>